a part three of three presentation. Uh, I did write proposals for parts one and two, and part three was selected. Um, <laughs> um, and so I am not going to presume that everybody here is, you know, has, has traveled my journey and is proficient at parts one and two. And so if you look at this and you're thinking, holy cow, what kind of crack pipe is she smoking? She's got, you know, 20 pages of slides here. I am not going to go over every single one of these slides. If you notice, especially the ones that have a little star on them, those are ones that are, for your information, that are kind of from my part one of three on this presentation. Okay, everybody with me? Do you have any more of those? I don't have them. The PowerPoint, I think there are tons of. The PowerPoint, is the student here? <laughs> Anybody see the stack? The student was going to get me some hot tea. <laughs> um, they, they printed 115, so I'm sure that we have more of the of the PowerPoint. Um, so just interrupt me. Maybe what she looks like if the student comes back in, or somebody's holding a. a, a um, so when somebody sees it, feel, feel free to just stop me so that everybody can get a handout. And then um, she's going to print some more of that um, evaluation. Okay. So course outline, and um, actually this is kind of covered a little bit, a couple slides of both, so you read fast if you want to. Um, your learning objectives. <clears throat> okay. So, um, this presentation is about clients who get referred for things like carpal tunnel. Do you ever feel like carpal tunnel is the only diagnosis that physicians know sometimes? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so this is for carpal tunnel and everything that is not. But um, most of the clients that come to us for carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel, uh, less common referrals but still in the ballpark of distal nerve entrapments which is kind of our part two of three presentation, the, the um, differential diagnoses for common um, uh, upper extremity distal um, complaints. Uh, less common, we have radial term, tunnel, um, which that's pretty obvious, radial nerve. Pronator syndrome, that's a median nerve entrapment. Uh, entrapment of the ulnar nerve at Guyon's Canal, and then entrapment of the radial nerve at the wrist would actually be the sensory branch, the dorsal radial sensory nerve um, here above the thumb. Okay, so um, that would be the, the nerve entrapments. Then we have the, um, you know, like the tendonitis group. And so doctors are a little better, right? I mean, most of them know um, the queer veins or bone tendonitis and, you know, wrist tendonitis. I get a lot, fair few referrals, but don't really see very much actual wrist tendonitis. Um, and then everything comes in as lateral epicondylitis. Doesn't matter if it's on the medial side, the lateral side. Doesn't matter if they say their little finger, their ring finger, and I'm all the time. If it's an elbow, it must be lateral epicondylitis. That's, that's what I would tend to see. Okay. So we have lots of names for these things. You know, muscul the musculoskeletal disorders, um, cumulative trauma, repetitive strain, work-related musculoskeletal disorders, I mean, use syndrome. Personally, um, I prefer cumulative trauma, and I know that's kind of considered an outdated, outmoded, um, but if clients coming in and they want me to write on that piece of paper that their disorder is 100%, you know, um, work-related musculoskeletal disorder, well, there's just not much 100% in my world. Um, it's, you know, it, I think of these things as cumulative over the many activities that we do and cumulative over our lifetime, you know, the, the uh, multiple traumas that we've had. Um, so here's cranism, I call these cranisms. Here's cranism number one. Your body remembers everything, it all counts. Okay. Yeah, my, my best uh, story, this guy, I was starting to think it was proximal and I said, so have you had any previous trauma, you know, to your neck, your upper back, your shoulder? He said, no. I said, even when you were like maybe in college, play football, or even high school football, and he said, no, 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 no. And I said, well, you know, nobody's that benign, you know. Everybody's, you know, you slipped on the ice when you were stationed in Germany or something, you know. And I said, you just wait. You're going to come back and you're going to remember. You're going to remember something. 
So he comes back for his follow-up, and he says, you know what, you were absolutely right, and I said, well, you know, almost always. <laughs> and he says, I totally forgot about the time I fell 13 feet out of that helicopter. <laughs> So, that's a little more dramatic than what I'm speaking of. Um, but even the, even the little things, you know, you, you, you collect enough of the little things and they can add up over time. Um, okay, so getting into our proximal etiologies of the carpal tunnel and the tennis elbow. The symptoms are distal, but the cause is often proximal. So we have thoracic outlet syndrome, which is my personal favorite. <laughs> um, I'm pretty passionate about this one. I think, uh, when would you say passionate about this? Yeah. 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 Um, so there's, there's the anatomical, um, which is pretty rare. And, and you don't want to say thoracic outlet to a physician, most particularly an orthopedic surgeon, because they'll quote you the statistics on the cervical, or they'll misquote you the statistics on the cervical rib, and, and the even more obscure, you know, vascular anomalies and whatnot. Because in their world, you know, it's surgical or it doesn't exist. You know, our world is no different from that. So, for me, it's, you know, postural, positional, um, and occupational, um, in one of the world's best kept secrets of the musculoskeletal world. Um, but a fairly easy fix, so that's the good news. Um, your myofascial trigger points, um, and this would be for the, my population again, you know, overwhelmingly guest workers, um, which interestingly enough, I was a guest worker at the time, and so, you know, the, the more the patient said, you know, it's kind of hard to explain, but do you know what it feels like, and blah, 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 and I said, you know, I do know what that feels like. <laughs> um, so the more I could, um, say that, you know, yes, I absolutely know that pain you're describing. The smarter I got and the more motivated I got to fix these things. But um, mostly the, 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 you know, the neck, the upper back, and especially, you know, bing, 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 the levator. Um, then you have the third group would be your cervical radiculopathies. Um, and then we're just going to just talk briefly about shoulder impingement as to kind of where I see that, you know, um, fitting. Okay. So, enthusiasm for only two thoracic outlet. Okay. So, your thoracic outlet patients will usually present as one of your distal nerve entrapments, or basically they will present as carpal tunnel. You know, that's going to be your provisional diagnosis from your, your, um, your primary care provider. Did the handouts come in? Yeah, apparently, so there's no more of the PowerPoint, but you will go get us some more of the PowerPoint. Um, I think I have this original copy up here. Okay, so so the secret to success in all this, um, to, to figure out that it's a, a proximal diagnosis, is you really, really, really got to intimately know those distal diagnoses, that part one of one and... I mean, part one of three and part two of three that, you know, we're not doing today. Um, have your facility invite me or something. Um, so you got to really figure out for yourself what is and what is not, you know, carpal tunnel, cubital tunnel, and then you got to kind of do the same thing all over again for the provision on the differential diagnoses, you know, the radial sensory nerve, um, pronator syndrome, all those things. Um, so... So you gotta learn your differentials for, you, you gotta learn your provisional diagnosis, your, your primary referral complaints first, then the distal provisional or distal differential diagnoses, and then, you know, when you can rule those out, then that kind of puts you in the ballpark of knowing when you're looking at something more possible. Or when in doubt, just assume that it's possible and throw some of those things in the treatment plan, so we'll, we'll cover that. Um, so my journey, uh, I arrived at Scott Air Force Base from Wilford Hall in uh, June of 2002. And to that point in time, if you would have asked anybody in the Air Force in the OT world that knew me, they would say, oh yeah, Crane, she's a pediatric expert. And in fact, probably they would still say that. They'd be really surprised to see me standing here today. Um, so I arrived at Scott Air Force Base as, as a pediatric expert um, to do hand and upper extremity, like exclusively. Um, and so the, uh, the flight commander, who was a physical therapist, she said, well, Major Crane, I mean, do you really think you can handle this caseload? 
Well, I had called Scott Air Force Base because I had been stationed at Scott Air Force Base as my very first assignment as a lieutenant with a year and a half of OT experience. And I said, well, ma'am, I do not think I could do any worse than I did as a lieutenant with one and a half years of experience. Um, so at Scott, uh, it's kind of where I began this journey with a couple of really great books, which, of course, I've shared those references with you. We'll talk about that. Um, great colleagues. Um, it, it's kind of a, a big little base, I guess you'd say. Uh, it's considered one of our bigger bases, but you know, compared to you know being someplace here like Hoover Hall, it's tiny. Uh, so I was the only occupational therapist um, the second time around at Scott, and, and I had really close access to my physical therapist. We were all in the same little clinic by that point. You know, they were still in the hall. Um, I had good access to the orthopedic surgeons and the orthopedic PA, um, the neurologist. They all had an open door, open email policy, and so I just pestered them away. Um, to educate myself. So, you know, a few hundred patients later, and, you know, and, and part of this journey, meticulous recording of the history and the symptoms that they told me and the symptoms that they told me on the exam and then what they told me on follow-up in terms of, you know, how compliant they've been with their home program and then what kind of results and, you know, which things in their home program were a little easier to be compliant with and, and all that stuff. And so I call it the wash and it's a repeat method of diagnosing and uh, treating patients. Um, in, let's see what year. I went back to Wilford Hall in 2005. So 2005, as soon as I got to Wilford Hall, um, the same physical therapist colonel was still there, and she sent all three of us OTs to the, um, the joint session. You know, the, the, every five years they have the American Society of Hand Therapists and the American Society of Hand Surgeons meet together. And so you have some sessions that are joint and some sessions that are, that are breakout, and so that was marvelous. And so, um, two things that happened there that were, you know, like almost life changing. It won't be quite that dramatic, but you know, pretty pretty big deal. Um, one of the things, one of the guys, and this was one of the surgeons whose name's on the big, you know, Hunter rehab of the hand, the big two volume Bible. I forget which one, but anyway, I can pick, I can pick him out in a lineup. Um, but he said, question the irrefutable. And for me, in the OT world. Questioning the irrefutable is questioning the NEM protocols. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I, when I was still on active duty and still doing hands, I would check every few months to make sure that they had not come out with a new addition. But by the time I retired in January, no, February of 2009, um, they had not. And so the Indianas at that point had been published in June of 2002, which meant they were, they were sub, um, submitted in June of 2001. Um, the other thing, though, not only were they old, they're not referenced. You go through that whole darn thing, and they're just, you know, a handful of references to any kind of, you know, research. It's just, you know, because we're the Indiana Protocol people, and we say so, and everybody else. Um, the other really great thing that happened at that conference is something called the Journals of Retraction. So another one of these surgeons whose name's on maybe, I think, the big two-volume green surgery of the hand, he called together from across the United States about five of his orthopedic surgeon, you know, board certified hand and upper extremity hand surgeon colleagues. And um, he created something that he called the Journal of Retraction. Now, it's not really a print journal, but boy, that would be great. So what the Journal of Retraction was, each of those five or six surgeons, he asked them to speak about a particular procedure that he happened to know that at one time, those surgeons, you know, each one a different procedure, touted as like the absolute best thing on the planet since sliced bread and had come full circle to the point that in some cases those same surgeons, at least one of them, said, I think the procedure should be outlawed. I do not think that it should be legal to do this procedure. It's so bad. Um, so question the irrefutable. I found the key is things need to make sense to me. You know, look for the logic in things because some of these journal of retraction things you know, I'm, I'm listening and I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm no CHT and I'm just like really barely starting this whole hand therapy thing. But um, if you look at the biomechanics of the situation, 